boys and girls, thank you for joining us once again, where today my very special guest is Rob Goodwin, who is uh, intelligent and cerebral and um, has a fine, <laughs> fine sort of a beard going on. Um, I'm a bit jealous of the hair, but, you know, uh, shit happens. You can't have everything, can you? Rob, <laughs> um, welcome back. I suppose this is the thank first you. time you've been on my channel, isn't it? I've been on yours, um, and this right. is the return visit. So anyway, welcome. Uh, this is your first ride on the crazy train, so the rules are keep your arms and legs inside the vehicle throughout the ride. Okay. Um, or don't, you know, whatever, but then be prepared to pay the consequences of that. Happy New Year. I'm excited. Yeah, and to you, Rob. It's, it's, uh, it's been a long time coming, us getting together on, on my Fine Fine channel for a chat. Um, tell us a bit about yourself, Rob. Where can people find you? What is it that you're into? How do you specialize? Go. Well, n number one, um, again, Happy New Year. And when I had you on my little channel, uh, I'm proud to say that uh, you are the third most watch show that I've ever done. And um, the one that's the highest I recorded two years ago. So uh, obviously people are paying attention. It was a real honor to have you on. So uh, it, that the numbers keep climbing. So uh, now it's time to, uh, to return the favor and uh, see if I can lower property values on your channel over there. So awesome. They don't get much, thank you. They don't get much lower, of course. Um. <laughs> But yeah. no, it, it's been fantastic, and and I've I've gotten so many responses um, for having you from having you on, and it, it was a real honor, and it was it was a blast. And uh, I, you know what? I, I've been doing this, the training coaching thing for for nearly thirty years, and obviously with just about anyone, there's been an evolution uh, of sorts from all the way back in 1994 when I when I jumped on this ride, and uh, culminating up to now, and it's it's been you know, non-ceasing, uh, the growth, the, the development. And since the, the boom of, uh, you know, the, the, the carnivore keto movement back in 2015, I was kind of quietly doing my own shit, just minding my own damn business. I have a gym. I work with people privately in the trenches and, uh, things were going great. And I, and I was kind of doing the keto thing and, uh, was having some good success with that. And, uh, when it got super popular in 15, it just kind of avalanched onto the scene. Uh, like I said, I was kind of doing my own shit and somehow word got out that I was coaching people doing ketogenic diets along with high intensity training, bodybuilding style, hypertrophy driven workouts, even, you know, all, all, you know, athletic endeavors included. And uh, out of the blue, just people started contacting me, wanted to know if I could help them with theirs. And that's how the whole ball got rolling. And uh, then I started a tiny little Facebook group that I thought about nine people would join. I thought, who the hell is going to give a shit about this? It was called ketogenic bodybuilding. And uh, to my astonishment, it just took off and we're about 11, 12,000 members strong now. And it's, it's a rabid group of people that are very involved in the group. And uh, it just kind of took off from there. And then uh, I started doing online coaching and uh, the rest is history. So, and probably more importantly regarding what you'll want to know is like many, I started off with a ketogenic style diet. I tweaked it a little bit. I would often say and still do that. It was following a, a, a hybrid ketogenic bodybuilding style training. When I say bodybuilding, I always have to qualify that. It doesn't mean people who are standing on a competition stage that's competitive bodybuilding. This is for anybody who had a real interest in developing their body, hypertrophy driven workouts, body composition, adjustment, whatever. And uh, that's kind of been my game. So when I sort of combined the two and found what really worked and even uh, competed myself, you know, late into my late 40s and early 50s and had some great success with that, uh, it just kind of took off. And that tiny little group exploded. And then for me, the natural evolution, and we talked about it briefly when I had you on, I really felt like the apex of this ketogenic world was the carnivore diet. And the reason that I jumped on board, and then we can start doing some Q&A here, is because when I was doing a competition prep, especially back in 2019, I had already had some success. But I noticed, you know, when you're doing physique competition, you know, bodybuilding, it's an extreme thing. It's unnatural. It really is. And I dare say I'm never going to say it was healthy to the level that I had to push myself to be successful at that level. And I noticed when I was doing, you know, I'd sort of altered the typical meathead bodybuilding style diet of high carb, high protein, low fat. 
I always felt better on more of a ketogenic diet. And uh, so I would have higher fat, uh, high protein and very low carbs. So it was a lot of steak and eggs, a lot of red meat, things of that nature. And what I would do is I would supplement tiny amounts of carbohydrate around training. And uh, of course, everybody in the keto sphere lost their fucking minds because I did that. But I kept telling people, listen, I, I don't, I'm not telling you, you need carbs. I would do tiny amounts as a strategic tool in my toolbox as an aesthetic thing around competition. And it was tiny amounts. And even though I was the guy that said, yeah, we're going to do a little bit of targeted uh, carbohydrate around training. Nobody listened that it was still only about 5% of my total caloric intake or, or energy intake for the day. Uh, they just heard the word carbohydrate and went crazy. And I got sort of vilified for that. But uh, when I was doing that, I was also taking in a lot of vegetable matter. And the name of the game in aesthetic driven training that I was doing is to look as lean and peeled and vascular and all these terms that you hear in that industry. And I, I felt like the vegetable matter was a detriment. I felt bloated all the time. I felt like shit all the time, gassy, heavy. And the name of the game was to be peeled, separated, and vascular on stage. So I dropped all vegetable matter in early 2019 and did the entire competition prep on nothing but meat and eggs. And then I would do a little bit of carbohydrate right before I did a heavy workout. And that, again, was just for an aesthetic because it, it aided, as you know, in vascularity and pump and all these things because I had to evaluate my physique in front of a mirror after these workouts to see how my progress was. So I used that as a tool. All the while admitting to everyone, you don't need carbohydrate, but they didn't want to hear that shit. They just wanted to know why was this keto guy dropping carbs around his training? So I was always defending that. And now that I'm not competing anymore, I don't even do that anymore. I'm, you know, probably 99% carnivore apart from uh, some occasional transgressions here and there. And uh, that's typically never more than I might... Uh, eat some of my wife's, you know, garlic sauteed cabbage once a month when she decides to make it because, you know, I'm not going to say that I don't, I'm not going to be that guy. But uh, when I dropped the vegetable matter and went to nothing but a very strict carnivore diet in my competition prep, I swept every division in 2019. I not only won the master's uh, division that I entered, but I also won the open division, which was people of all ages. And I think I did that twofold. I think the, the way that I trained along with the way that I consumed this carnivore diet, along with the crazy work ethic and damn good genetics, I'll be honest, I think that paid huge dividends. And I was, I was kicking guys' asses half my age. And uh, when I told them I did it by eating fucking steak and eggs and just training my asses off and dieting harder than them, that that was the key to success, uh, it turned a lot of heads. And uh, since then... A lot of people have come to me as the guy that can blend carnivore style diets with hard training. And when I, I, I got, I found your channel early in 2022, fell in love with it. I've learned so much from you and I'm going to let you talk in a minute, but I just wanted to get this off my chest. I've always said, I'm the guy in the trenches. Uh, I don't have the credentials you have but I have time in the trenches. I've been doing this for nearly 30 years, every single day on the gym floor. And now for the past several years online with real people and my credibility is on the line. I'm not going to spout a bunch of horse shit just to get clients only for them to find out that what got them to come to me was a line of horse shit. So my credibility is on the line. So when you hear what I have to say on my YouTube channel or Instagram or whatever, what you're going to get from me is just an amplified version of that because I, I have to walk the walk. I'm not just selling some bullshit products. You know, I, I have to do that. And when I found you and everything that you were saying was resonating with me and I got some, all these aha moments from working with clients and was able to tweak and fix things. And when I sort of walked away from, you know, tracking calories and when I just changed more of the effective energy intake, the types of food, not necessarily the amounts of food, everything changed. And when I heard you say eight reps until, you know, not being able to do nine, I'm like, okay, he's, he's an advocate of high intensity training to failure. So, you know, if I kind of found my spirit animal <laughs> when I stumbled onto you. And uh, I think as you've noticed, I've been uh, in most of your premieres whenever I can get to one uh, shooting the shit with everybody, the loyal legion of uh, fans that you have in there. So 
that's kind of my story in a nutshell, as I think it would would pertain to your audience. Awesome, yeah. I mean, my audience, Rob, uh, surely, though, they're just zealots and dogmatics, aren't they? <laughs> Isn't that what was going on here? Let's talk a bit about this 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 idea with, with zealotry and dogmatism. Right. Because I know you have some views on that. So sure. let us have them. Well, uh, the, the thing that bothers me is, is, and you may disagree, and that's okay. We don't all dress alike. But when I'm working with individuals uh, very, very closely, and that's what I do, sometimes they can be inundated with, with this information within this carnivore or ketogenic space that may differ slightly from mine or what I found might work for others. And I've always said, I'm on record saying this over and over again, if what you're doing is working for you, then keep doing it. It's none of my fucking business. But if you don't feel like that what you're doing is completely optimal, then maybe listen to what I have to say. And what I have to say is drawn from decades of experience and by listening and paying attention to people like yourself and, you know, using and assimilating that information and, you know, employing it into their diets, it's all about turning knobs and pulling levers. I was in, for instance, for example, just, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, I was in a, and this happens all the time. I was in a carnivore Facebook group, which you know how those can be. Yeah. And uh, this poor woman was, you did this very lengthy, very emotional post about how she had uh, lost several dress sizes. Um, there was a, a great alleviation of metabolic distress and uh, inflammatory markers were, were dropping, blood work was doing better. And she was just espousing all these benefits of a carnivore diet. And somewhere within there, she'd mentioned the fact that she was drinking coffee. And one of the moderators of the group just went into a fucking tirade and launched all over this poor woman because she was drinking coffee. Now, this woman has made a significant lifestyle change, has done some amazing things, but some zealot, dogmatic asshole couldn't focus on that. He had to jump in and start tearing her apart for drinking a cup of damn coffee. Now, whether or not people agree that coffee is part of a carnivore, di carnivore diet is, is they're kind of missing the point here. I think we can all unite underneath this carnivore ancestral health umbrella to a degree and focus on how we can use our powers for good and not evil and stop fighting amongst ourselves. Because if this continues on, we're no better than damn vegans in, in this zealotry. So I, I think there needs to be more uniting in the space and uh, pulling together to help change people for the better, because there's so many good things and if we can differ on a few details. That's fine. But it just drives me insane. But as a coach, as a trainer that, you know, working with people uh, to have people's hopes and dreams crushed because some asshole with an agenda that's just trying to sell a product or get clicks or get likes is uh, derailing him or her. It, it just really irritates the shit out of me. And I know we can't save the world, but if we can take each individual as they come across us and, and try to do what we can to improve their quality of life, knowing what we know about the species appropriate diet, which that's your term. I, I stole it from you and I use it to this day every day. You know, that's what we need to focus on. So this dogmatic bullshit that is just raining all over us in this space is a little bit mind numbing. And I don't, I wonder how you feel about that. Yeah. I, th I think for me, Rob, it boils down to that, which is, or can be thought of with good reason to be a minor transgression an amount of coffee. Obviously, too much coffee can be very, very problematic. Sure. Uh, in, in fact, I'm addressing that right now. I have, at the beginning of this year, which is three days ago now for me, I have cut coffee out completely. Good for you. Um, I have not. Yeah, <laughs> no, and, and I'm not enjoying it, Rob. <clears throat> I'm not enjoying it at all. Um, I, I have been a heavy user of coffee for a number of years, and so it's like quite a major thing to do. Um, so I'm drinking this fucking tea at the moment. It's, <laughs> it's, um, it's a licorice-flavored infused chai or some bastard thing, and it's... Uh, anyway, there's that. sounds that. terrible. Oh, it's, the, the, the vanilla that's in it smells good, but you don't actually get a vanilla flavor. It doesn't taste like vanilla. It just tastes like bark that's been infused with uh, anyway so cheers yeah so i mean okay yep a bit of coffee not not such a big deal you know right. two or three cups a day fine 10 cups a day not so fine of course um and also you know 
being dogmatic about that kind of thing is very different from being dogmatic about saying, no, Paul, you should not pour 400 grams of carbohydrate down your stupid uh, neck. That, that, was my, yeah, that was my next topic. And, and yeah. I've got strong opinions about that too. And thank you for bringing that to light. There is a huge difference because I truly believe what you believe and what you've said, and you, you've carried the ball on this one. This Saladino guy is a carb addict. Yeah. And I also think if you go beyond that, he felt that he was diluted in the carnivore space. And I think it's an ego thing where he has to be the guy. So he had to differentiate himself and separate himself slightly from the carnivore community and use the term animal base. So now he's like, okay, I'm going to eat, you know, meat and organs, but now I'm going to eat shit tons of fruit and honey and all of these things. And it's animal base. And that's my thing now. So it, he has to have control of this segment of the space and, and firmly be entrenched in that as a, as a way to differentiate himself from everyone else at the detriment of others. Jesus Christ. I mean, if, if, I, if I took even a quarter of my clients, the ones that tolerate some carbohydrate, and I suggested they take in three, 400 grams of fucking fructose, fructose every day, they'd be a complete wreck. And I, he's got to know that. He, he's got to know that. And it just drives me insane that he keeps pushing that narrative and not at least putting a disclaimer on it that says, hey, your results may vary. You may only be able to tolerate a very small amount of this. You need to experiment. You know, everybody's mm -hmm. not me. Uh, I think what he's doing is a terrible disservice. And it pisses me off because I used to like that guy. I, I thought, you know, on, on the outset, he was doing a whole lot of good. And now he's just doubling down on that where he, he could be making some adjustments to that ideology or at least the way he markets it and to mm. help some people out there avoid a, a fucking pitfall. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's affable. He's um, charismatic. He presents himself in a hip and cool way for the young kids. Oh, yeah. But he never really was a carnivore and he did it wrong anyway. Right. <laughs> right, right. Uh, you know, the... Therapist card. The, the, exactly. Therapist card. The first thing he did wrong was this inane insistence, this dogmatism that he himself has around the consumption of organs. Well, who's his business partner? Well, it was. The liver king. I mean, come <laughs> yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. So you want to destroy your health quick smart. You want to destroy any hope that carnivore is going to work for you and effectively and well long term. All you need to do is eat a bunch of liver or desiccated liver or, you know, if you want to really, really fuck this up for yourself, that's the, that's the way to go. Then you'll start having all sorts of problems with electrolyte imbalances and other toxicity issues. Then you'll start thinking, well, the only cure for this is to pour carbohydrates down my neck. Right. She's a slippery slope, basically. So are we being zealots? Are we being dogmatics? Or are we just telling you the truth? and letting you make your own decision about what you want to do and who you want to believe. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, just think I tell people, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think it's hilarious that Paul is throwing around this accusation that everybody that disagrees with him is a dogmatic. No, we just have a different view. Right. Yeah. Sorry, Rob, you go ahead. Oh, no, no. I mean, he's, he, like many, you know, it, to, as far as he's concerned, what he's espousing is, the be all end all gospel and everybody else is wrong. And, and he's got it nailed down there's wiggle room in a lot of this stuff. Um, I work with so many people, you know, I've got 86 people online that I work with and 25 here in my gym that I work with every single day. And uh, I have to make minor tweaks and adjustments to everyone uh, with the competitors, the physique competitors that I work with, you know, some of them, to look absolutely stunning on stage and win, we have to do a strategic carb up right before they go on stage to maximize that aesthetic. Mm -hmm. I also have clients that if I did that to them, they would completely fall apart, flatten out, look like dog shit. So we can't do that. There are adjustments to be made. I have some people that I need to go through a slight carbohydrate refeed every once in a, in a blue moon. And it seems to help push things along and make those adjustments. And that's very, very few. That's only a handful. For the great majority of everybody I work with, it's 
meat and eggs, baby, you know, meat, eggs, poultry, fish. And I do advocate some, if you can tolerate it, some, uh, some full fat dairy. Some of my clients do extremely well on that and some completely fall apart. So Mm -hmm. I have to adjust that accordingly. So I've got some people uh, subsisting on a lot of, uh, you know, cheese and and even raw milk when you can get it uh, in addition to their meat and eggs and their, their strict carnivore diet and just crushing it. And some people where just, you know, w- one serving of dairy would completely crush them. So it, it, it all has to be considered and you have to pull those levers and turn those knobs with everybody you work with because everybody's individualized to a degree. Now we can go under our umbrella, our carnivore umbrella and say, this is, this is the lifestyle. This is the way human beings are meant to eat and consume nutrition. This is the, the greatest benefit uh, for the long haul, for our longevity, for our health and performance. But within that umbrella, certain adjustments may have to be made according to the individual. So I'm not talking about saying, hey, everybody can take in you know, 16 papayas, nine bananas, and a gallon of honey every morning and do fine with that. that that's going to be an extreme outlier. And there aren't many of those, and we both know that. Mm-hmm. So it's it it does that that kind of dogmatic view is irritating as shit. They, we can all agree to disagree on some minor details according to the individual, but to say my version or the highway one hundred percent as I dictate it, I think is dangerous. Yeah, agreed, absolutely. So with that in mind, I guess that the next obvious segue is that that brings us to a sort of sector of commentators or responders, if you like, because mostly these people are reactive, who will come around the social media and who have, for some reason, an idea that their opinion is valid too, for some reason, and these people claim to be what they call evidence-based. Oh, God. (laughs) Uh, I knew that would set you off. (laughs) Go for it. These people, these people, I'm so tired of this evidence-based science bullshit. Uh, it's, it's mind numbing. It is doing so much harm to everyone. Uh, and the sheep just blindly soak it up because you throw that term science they're, they're, What's really irritating is you have people like yourself who pour through the science and different and, and, and deal it out properly and rigorously define what it is where you have other people that just take, you know, what we, there was a great, in the exercise physiology world, which sometimes can be a bad thing. The great Arthur Jones once said to him in the world of exercise physiology and often in nutrition, a PhD just simply meant piled high and deep in bullshit. And in many ways, even today, I think that's the case. And you have done a spectacular job of picking apart some of those people. And I know, you know, who we're talking about here, but there's so much of that out there. I mean, just with the conversation about how calories, calories are defined, how they're utilized, the inaccuracies with tracking, the inaccuracies with uh, measurements of success with these calculators and tests and all this bullshit. You know, I knew something was amok many, many years ago, working with clients. I, I, I have, and people, Tom, these evidence-based people tell me I'm crazy. It's calories in, calories out. That's the science. It's settled. You can't argue it. You can't go near it or, you know, you're the whack job tinfoil hat asshole. But, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I have taken some poor woman into some extreme caloric deficit and nothing happened. Nothing happened. Everything shut down. Mm. And it didn't take me long to realize there's something at play here far beyond that energy consumption. And these numbers are not accurate. And we need to define what that accuracy is based on the the gross intake or the weight or the volume of food and the types of food, not just a number of calories, which, as you know, you pointed out, is just heat anyway, and and not a great way to talk about how we consume food Mm. and and nutrition. So once I started making those adjustments by asking clients a series of pinpoint questions on a very regular basis and made those adjustments on the types of food and the volume of food and relative to their output, then that's when all the changes got made. I, a story that I tell all the time, and I know it's just me, and, but when I was doing, I did a show in 2021. It was a national qualifier. It was a big show. 
And I placed first in two categories. Very proud moment. But I had uh, that qualified me to go to nationals, to masters nationals. So it was the big event in the United States where all the top masters competitors went to try to earn a pro card, which is something I never cared about. I just liked the experiment of it. But I, I earned that place. So I immediately went back to prep for that competition. It was only about three weeks away. Well, I had refeed, you know, caloric refeed right after I won in the, the qualifier show and then immediately went back to prepping for the nationals, which was the big show. And let me go ahead and tell you, I was, you know, a 215 pound bodybuilder in strongest shit, in great shape, very, very lean. And I knew I needed to be about 209, 210 pounds to be at my best on stage for that competition. Let me tell you, there were points where I was consuming a thousand calories a day. Imagine that a thousand calories a day in a desperate attempt to get down to that super lean 4% body fat level and nothing moved. Nothing happened. Nothing changed day after day after day. 1400 calories. Let's try 1200 calories. Let's try 1800. Let's try a thousand, a thousand, a thousand, nothing, nothing, nothing. And I absolutely fell apart. Ended up placing sixth in a show that if I was at my best, I felt I could have got top three. And I completely fell apart. There were moments when I was backstage in Pittsburgh at, at these nationals where I wasn't quite sure where I was. There were moments uh, that I was incoherent. I felt like my body was shutting down. All I wanted to do was sleep. I felt like I was going to vomit at any moment. And I was probably a candidate to be taken to a hospital. That's how sick and weird it was. So don't tell me just by reducing calories, you're going to achieve that level of leanness that you're hoping to achieve and everything's going to be fine. My body completely shut down. And that's what happens metabolically from a physiological level. When you deprive the body of those nutrients at a certain level, the body just shuts down. I have worked with so many people, especially women, where I have taken them down to what the calculation said was a steep caloric deficit that the evidence-based community would say, there's, it's foolproof at this level. She's going to drop body fat. She's going to do this. She's going to do that. And I've had these poor women literally stall, fall apart, and actually gain weight when I take them to that super low level. Then when I would feed them properly on the right species-appropriate foods and make those certain lifestyle changes that, that we talk about in this space, then the magic would start to happen and things would start moving along again by adding food, adding calories made changes to get them to start dropping body fat and improving that body composition again. And it happens over and over and over again. These people pushing this bullshit that, that, that may be some lab coat wearing PhD, and they're just being, they're just regurgitating something that they were spoon, bet, spoon fed by some other clueless idiot that uh, of this dogmatic point of view they're, it's doing such a disservice to so many people. And then you and I are working with people, you know, in the trenches and doing these consultations where we're actually increasing food and changing the types of food and turning these knobs and levers. And it's not about calories in, calories out. It's not about deprivation, starvation, and misery. It's about making a change in the intake and the gross volume. And then everything starts to happen again. So yeah. the evidence-based crowd is, is mind-numbingly toxic to that poor individual that that isn't quite educated yet is is just going down the path and they don't know exactly where they might need to go and then they get told by some zealot that you know oh just take your calories down to 1200 calories and you're guaranteed to lose weight and then what happens well, well they then, may lose a little bit at first it's guaranteed to it fuck stalls. them up isn't it it it's guaranteed to fuck them up it, that from a physiological metabolic level they become a train wreck yeah. And they say, oh, it's not hormones. It has nothing to do with hormones. It's all about calories in, calories out. Mm -hmm. You know, once you go down that road and you're working with people and you become educated and you understand how this shit works, that approach, that, that, that one approach seems so ridiculous to, to suggest to someone that, oh, just, just starve yourself and everything's going to happen for you. It's just mind numbing. And people are soaking it up. And here we are in January. Here's, you know, the legions of the New Year's resolutioners are, are, you know, at our door. 
And they think, you know, okay, just go do a bunch of cardio, starve myself, eat fucking salads, and everything's going to, you know, come together for me. And then what happens? Nothing happens. They feel like dog shit. They feel like they're deprived, starved, metabolically disrupted. They say, screw this shit. And what do they do? They go back to eating the way they ate before. And then the cycle continues. Now they've probably lost some lean mass. And then it's like taking one step forward and 12 back. And then they just continue the cycle until they do it again next January. It's, it's about getting educated by people who understand that it goes far beyond just a caloric calculation of in and out. It's just ridiculous. Yep. Absolutely. Couldn't have said any of that better myself, Rob. Absolutely. I think you probably toxic. could. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, d- <laughs> I have on, th- on three occasions in the last few months, I've had opportunity either directly face to face interacting with various people who have various ideas or tit for tat because those people actually lack the testicular fortitude to actually face me. Um, I've had a discussion with uh, three different individuals really, um, or three different groups of individuals, if you like, about this calories in, calories out. And the first law of thermodynamics, though, this thing they like to try and hit you over the head with and say, this is this is the slam dunk, this is why you lose and we win. And on each of those three occasions, my challenge has been very simple. It's been, okay, why don't you tell me what the first law of thermodynamics says? All three of these so-called experts, one of whom holds a PhD, got it wrong. They could not even fucking cite this law of thermodynamics that they're trying to hit me over the head with. Right. They got it wrong. And we're talking lame Norton, PhD, lame L-A-M-E, lame Norton, PhD, who said the first law of thermodynamics states that mass cannot be created nor destroyed. It can only be changed in form. Well, that's great, lame, except Mass is not conserved, and the first law of thermodynamics doesn't even mention mass at all. In fact, it explicitly right. excludes any discussion on mass. Um, of course, Greg Douchebag Doucette said exactly the same thing because he was just parroting Lame Norton, who he's got a severe chubby for, frankly, right. at the end of the day. And then the third individual who said that exact thing to me was Mark Smelly Bell yep. on a podcast that he invited me on because he thought he was going to tear me to bits and show me up. Actually, it was a quite different podcast to what he thought it was going to be, wasn't it? Yep. (laughs) And and Uh, what irritates me about those three individuals you just named is they were deeply entrenched in the bodybuilding world. Yep. You know, all of them, you know, have done bodybuilding. You know, Greg Doucette is an IFBB pro. I know Lane Norton has competed at at a fairly high level back in the day. Uh, Mark Bell, powerlifter turned bodybuilder. Yep. So. That's my, that's my forte mm. body, but that's the industry I grew up in. I was entrenched in the bodybuilding world now for 30 years. So imagine how it feels for me, the guy in the bodybuilding world, the hypertrophy driven training world, surrounded by everybody telling me that I'm the idiot, that it's what I'm doing is not going to work. It's all about calories in calories out, thermodynamics, blah, 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 blah. And you know, it, the credibility, I mean, Years ago, when I read the the first law of thermodynamics and how it allegedly uh, applied to human nutrition, I just believed it. Why? It was written by a PhD in a book. So here I am, a young trainer trying to do good in the world, believing that, oh, with these credentials and this level of credibility, I have to listen to what they say like it's the gospel. Well, once again, it didn't take me very long to realize you better question everything and you better get deep into the trenches and roll your damn sleeves up and get blue collar with this shit and work the shit out and really investigate and go beyond what's right here and learn for yourself and then take that information and use it for good and really get down with these people and help these people. I stopped paying, paying attention to that horse shit many years ago and knew that it went well beyond that. And so it's, it's, we're making a dent, uh, but in this physique, you know, development world, in this world of aesthetic, people are still soaking up this horse shit like it's gospel. But, uh, you know, we have to keep taking it grassroots the best we can and keep chipping away at it. And I, the one thing that I'm proud of is, is I think I've made a dent in that world because I was able to stand on stage toe to toe with uh, guys who were, you know, believing of that methodology and was able to do very, very well. And also, to my credit, you know, people that I've coached and taken to victories, I've never had a client uh, pay place lower than top three 
And, uh, and th- that's a small segment of the people I coach, you know, of all the clientele that I work with only 1% actually compete. But to me, bodybuilding is about anybody who has a desire to improve their body to any degree, to change that body composition. Muscle is life. Muscle is everything. You know, we have to be strong. We have to be fit. We have to be capable, especially as we get older and sarcopenia it becomes inevitable. It's the inevitable loss of muscle mass, and, muscle mass. And we had better learn how to maximize what we have and take strides to improve on that to every degree we can, because that's going to be the difference between you being a feeble old man that's falling apart and somebody who's strong and capable and able to still do damage in this world long after most people have expired and can barely walk across the floor. And in with that is a ancestral diet. It's huge. And back way back in the, in the seventies and the sixties, there were bodybuilders back in those days who weren't sauce to the damn gills and doing, you know, lots of steak, lots of eggs, lots of raw milk and just crushing it. And somewhere the waters got muddied and we abandoned that. Drugs got more important. People stopped paying attention to real human nutrition and it completely went off the rails. And here we are. So now we're back to let's reel these people back in and try to reverse that damage because now that I'm not competing anymore, it's about longevity. It's about health. I no longer have a desire to get to 4% body fat and suffer for six months to get there doing irreparable damage to myself. I know it wasn't healthy. Anybody that comes to me and says, I want to be a competitive bodybuilder, I say, okay, great. It was a great experience. But understand, it's not about health. So when you get done and your competitive years are behind you, you're going to have to do some damage control. And I'm doing that now. And luckily for me, I know how to do that. And I know how to repair you know, the, the damage that I did by suffering on a diet for six, seven months at a time in order to get to a ridiculously low level of body fat that I knew was doing me damage. So now it's about going from a competition body to an apocalypse body to be ready for any fucking thing that comes my way. And to have that, the emphasis has to be on health, not just the aesthetics. So that's where I'm at now. And I tell people that right when I, they hire me as a coach, Here's the goal. Yes, we're going to focus on aesthetics. Yes, I know you want to look great and you want to be a size two. But in order to get to that level, there is going to be some damage involved. So we have to get in front of that and try to you know, get this thing back on the rails and focus on that longevity in addition to finding your genetic potential, the best genetic potential that you can achieve by doing this healthfully. And I always tell people, if you reach your genetic peak, or get as close to it as you can, you're not going to be disappointed with the results. You're not going to be disappointed with how you look in the mirror. So that, that's the level that we have to push these people to. And it's 100% begins with a species appropriate diet. And I 100% believe that. And then there's sorting out the tiny details that go along with it. Brilliant. Once again, couldn't have said any of that better myself. Top shelf stuff. That, ladies and gentlemen, is why you listen to guys like Rob Goodwin and not scumbag douchebags like Greg Douchebag Doucette who looks the way he looks, nothing to do with his <laughs> nutrition, by the way. He looks the way he looks because he's juiced to the gills. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely no question about it, and he admits it. Right? Do you see what the guy eats? I mean, oh, it's again, just crap. It's just garbage. It's just crazy. It's yeah. like fucking popcorn and French toast and all yeah. this shit. And- yeah. You know, he's just chasing away uh, and, and lifting and drugging himself to that physique. Yeah. And, and it, again, I, not to keep beating this poor dead horse, but it irritates the shit out of me because I feel like if I sat down with Greg Doucette and we just talked about bodybuilding, we'd probably get along. It'd probably be fun. I, I know that guy's not the parrot he portrays, you know, on his videos. Mm. But then at the same time, I'd also be wildly disappointed because he is an IFBB professional bodybuilder. And then the things that comes out of his mouth regarding nutrition, and then, especially as it pertains to health yeah. and longevity is just completely off the rails. Yeah. And that's, what's very, very disappointing about that. Yeah. And you know, here's a bloke who was caught with $250,000 worth of gear in his house with the intent of supply and pushing it on other um, impressionable young people who, or impressionable, not so young people, impressionable people who, you know, want to try and look like he looks, who are also buying his cookbook, 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 
Don't, don't forget his cookbook. Yeah, um, don't forget the cook. The cookbook. Jesus, that to get, boy to is get a his kid. French toast recipe. Yeah, is it? he's a complete cookbook. That boy. He really calories, is. calories, calories. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, he's he's the parrot from Aladdin. I know in real life he, he doesn't is. really talk that way. Um, he doesn't. I look know, at his it, old old videos. He had to turn on that character to get likes and clicks. And yep. you know, it, it's one thing to do that and be giving good information, but it's another thing to do that to be peddling some horse shit. Yep. Exactly. And that's that's for me where while I'll take the piss out of him for the voice and the and the character and all of that sort of stuff, my main problem with characters like him and like Lame Norton, who's even worse really, because he purports to come from a position of authority in, in academia, which he he doesn't at all. Um, you know, a certificate, a PhD certificate, and maybe half a dozen publications in low-end journals, mostly in sports science, actually. Nothing to do with nutrition. Right. Doesn't give you a lot of credibility, frankly. Um, but the way they deal with that is to try and undercut my credibility by pretending that my academic background doesn't exist. Right. Well, just do a Google. It's not hard to find. It really is there. It's it's, it's in the peer-reviewed literature. Whatever, whatever, boys. Um, well, the thing, and, and, and Bart, I got to tell you, when I started following you, I, I saw Professor Bart K. That's as far as I took it. I didn't check into your background. It didn't mean shit to me mm. because it only took me about, you know, I, I took a day and just started like, you know, banging through all your videos. And it, what you said resonated. It made logical, rational sense. I didn't have to pick it apart or deeply research it because I'd been in this game long enough yeah. to, to be able to call bullshit on somebody. And, you know, I don't give a shit. I mean, you have amazing credentials, but that's not what got me. It's like, okay, this guy, you know, is f playing a wildly entertaining character, which I loved. And everything he's saying, though, you know, even within that character is, is you can't dispute it especially if you get out there in the trenches and you apply it because everything that you were saying are certain levels of experience uh, over my career that I have discovered. And it, you were just lining up or knocking over the dominoes for me. And I really, really appreciated that. And I felt like, okay, here's another kindred guy in the industry who is uh, giving some great information and it, more of it needs to be heard. And I've always said, you know, I list, I'm the boots on the ground. I take my orders from the generals who have the strategic uh, and, the, and the planning and, and all of the, this nailed down. And then what I do is I will take that information and I will break it down and make it understandable and roll my sleeves up and put on my, my boots and I will get on the battlefield with these clients and walk them through the details. So it's people like you that we can get this, we can get our marching orders from, get, get the details. And then, the, you know, guys like me can get out there on the gym floor or get across from somebody on a Zoom comp consultation. And that's just part of the arsenal, part of the weaponry that we can use to make people successful in their journey to being the best human beings that they can possibly be. So what you're doing is great work. And, you know, when guys like we just mentioned have half a million or a million followers, it just irritates me that uh, it's people like yourself or maybe even me that should have those numbers out there so we can get that information out for good. Absolutely. You're doing great work. So appreciate it very much. Thank you, Rob. Look, I could talk to you, Rob, forever, all day and all night. 100%. Yeah. Um, but we will have to close off. I've got to rush off. I've got to pay uh, consultancy hour in the next hour, starting in, in a few minutes. Well, somebody, somebody spent good money then. So that's that's. They have. Absolutely. Anyway, <laughs> in the meantime, folks, if they want to get hold of Rob, you can do that on Instagram. It's Rob Goodwin Official. You can go to his website, which is robgoodwin.com. And yep. you can also check him out on YouTube. His YouTube channel is called Ketogenic Bodybuilding. We'll put all those links under the video in the show notes so you I can click on them. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your time, Rob. As I say, you are a gentleman and you are a scholar, even you know though you don't sort of identify that way. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I just use my credentials actually to annoy the people that um, that think I don't have them. Um, As well, you should. Yeah. And we we have got to get together again and talk a little bit about training. Because yes, please. I'm dying to pick your brain about that. So uh, uh, maybe we can get together in the future here and, and take this a step further. Absolutely. So boys and girls, if you want to see that, put a comment under the video saying, yes, please get him back, get him back. 
by any means possible. And we will don't forget to hit the like button because Yellow Ted gets very, very cross if you don't hit the like button. And the last thing that you want is a late night visit from Yellow Ted. Let me tell you. Isn't that right, Ted? Let's have it. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right, boys and girls. Join me happy next time. Happy New Year. Yeah, happy Thank New you Year very to you. Much. Yep. All right. See you later. Ciao. See ya.